And welcome to a special GIS feature. I am Public Health Communications Specialist Natasha Letsum. The Social Development Department is asking the community to break the silence and help end child abuse in the Virgin Islands as the territory observes the month of April as Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month. Today, our conversation revolves around the importance of raising awareness on child abuse prevention and encouraging individuals, organizations, businesses, and communities to support and advocate for vulnerable children and families within the territory. We have with us Division Head of Children, Family, and Protective Services, Mrs. Stacy Stout James, Kendall, Kendall Bob, Head of Family and Juvenile unit within the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force, and Mr. Stacy Mather, Director of Youth Empowerment Project. Thank you for coming on the program. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Now, to get us started, we're in the middle of Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month, which is being observed under the theme, Break the Silence. Why is breaking the silence so important, Mrs. James? Well, Ms. Letzum, we started breaking the silence. Well, we started our awareness campaign for Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month from 2003, I believe. And we continue to ask the public to support us because we think it's important for organizations and communities to get involved in our awareness efforts. We want to also be able to support our families who might be affected um, by child abuse in all its forms. And create a culture where awareness is a key and awareness is important for our community mm -hmm. in speaking out against child abuse and prevention. Mm -hmm. And what role does your department play in all of this? Well, Social Development Department is the main agency within our territory that deals with child protection. And so we fall under the Ministry of Health and Social Development and we're mandated by law to protect all children of the Virgin Islands. And so we think it necessary every year to remind persons that it's not just a department effort, and that's why we continue to ask the public to join us in our prevention efforts every year from 2003, like I said. Mm -hmm. And joining you on the panel, we also have a police officer. Uh, Mr. Bob, tell us what is the police's role as it pertains to child abuse? Our role as police officers is to investigate all criminal matters that involve child abuse in our territory. We have a good working relationship with social development. They are the department that deals with uh, all the social ills, investigate all the social aspects when it comes to child abuse. So we work along together, hand in hand, so that we can deal with persons who are victims of child abuse. Mm -hmm. And we have the director of the Youth Empowerment Project, Mr. Stacy Mather. Uh, Mr. Mather, help us to understand the role that you do and how it fits into this whole picture. Well, um, thank you for having me. YEP is an out-of-school time program by UK definition. And we're basically where children would come between after school, before they go home, and on weekends and school holidays. And one would recognize that outside of the home, if there is an issue with child abuse, it may, there would be signs that could be seen. And as a safe haven for children, we try to look out for these signs and assist the Department of Social Development in these issues. Mm -hmm. Now, Ms. James, you, you have a number of people around you, different agencies you collaborate with. Tell me, how do you work in tandem with police and with agencies such as YEP? Well, we have a long-standing working relationship with police. Once we receive a report of any form of child maltreatment, automatically we make contact with police. If police gets the information first, again, vice versa, they would make contact with us and we would respond together. So while police deals with the investigation side, we would deal with the protection side, make sure that the child is safeguarded from any further harm. Um, if we have to um, remove that child from 
whoever the alleged perpetrator is, whether male or female, if they're living with them in that environment, then we do what we call a diligent search for that, for, um, to make sure that that child is placed with somebody who will keep them safe and from further harm. Mm -hmm. In relation to YEP, we've had a very good relationship with YEP over the years, but um, they've made contact with us after we had the child protection training in February, mm -hmm. and they attended that training, and Mr. Matha made contact with me personally and said, I want to get involved. I realize that there are areas in our program mm -hmm. that we need assistance with, your assistance with, and so they've created a policy as it relates to child protection within YEP, mm -hmm. and they've asked us to work along with them. So I thought it was very important to get them involved at this stage and to show um, we really mean what we say when we want communities, we want organizations to get involved and take ownership on take ownership for child protection. And this is goes back to what I was saying earlier about creating a culture where it's not just social development's business, it's all of our business. Mm -hmm. So any persons who work with children, whether in churches, whether in organizations such as yep, community organizations, we encourage them to take ownership of, of this because these are where the children come. Mm -hmm. And they are probably some of the first people that would see you know, something odd or something worth worrying about mm -hmm. and you know I, I really have to applaud Mr. Metha and the good works that he continues to do at YEP and for getting involved and joining us mm -hmm. in creating that culture where we are saying as a community as organizations that we will denounce child abuse in all its forms throughout our Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Now Mr. Metha you seem to be making many strides over there at YEP. How many students do you have and if you were to be presented with a suspected case, how would you interface with social development and the police to remedy that situation? So um, YEP is in its 10th year, mm -hmm. right? And we have provided activities for close to 800 children over the last eight, um, eight years, 10 years, sorry. Um, if we notice something with a child and it might be a behavior change, we are not gonna investigate it, we're gonna see what it is, we might ask the child, you know, is something going on? We may ask um, one of the facilitators, the facilitators that we have there may notice something, and we have all protocols that we're putting in place. We are reporting what is going on. Mm -hmm. So we will call a relevant agency, social development, if they're not available, we have protocols to follow. Um, and we let them do the investigations, we let them take it from there. And what would happen is if there is something that we can do as a medium between the child and the relevant authorities, then we would assist in that way. Our goal is to be a safe haven, as I said earlier, for a child. Mm -hmm. And trust is very important. So we try to maintain the trust of the child. Wonderful. Now, it's very fitting to talk about the statistics and the emerging trends that we're seeing with child abuse cases. So um, talk to us a bit, Ms. James, about the statistics as it relates to abuse in general. Well, like I said, we've been doing this, we're in our 12th year of observation, but we always uh, look at our statistics within social development to see what we need to be doing as far as awareness and bringing information to the public. Mm -hmm. With that said, we realized from in 2000, around 2011, usually for us, physical abuse would be the highest type of case reported to us. Um, a change happened in 2011, and we realized that sexual abuse started to become our highest type. And it has remained our highest type from 2011 to present. Last year, for instance, we had 31 reported cases overall. 17 of those cases were of a sexual nature. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that the year before, we had 26 overall and of those 14 were of a sexual nature and 14 was the highest type in the past years there was a difference in types physical abuse were highest type but after 2011 come forward so for the last five six years mm -hmm. sexual abuse remains the highest type and of course i think everybody would agree that 
when you think about sexual abuse, it is the most grotesque of yes. the types. Mm -hmm. And so that's why in 2009, we broke out based on the statistics we were seeing locally. UNICEF, of course, was encouraging us, the overseas territories, to um, come on with this Break the Silence initiative. Mm -hmm. So we're not um, the only one within the region. Actually, based on the statistics that they were seeing as well, other uh, islands, right, throughout the region, they were seeing sexual abuse becoming one of the most prevalent types. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, in 2009, we thought it fit in to join with UNICEF and roll out or break the silence campaign. And that's why for the last couple of years, we continue, um, because sexual abuse continues to be a highest type locally, mm -hmm. we continue to ask the public to break the silence and end child sexual abuse specifically. Mm -hmm. However, of course, you know, all of the types are important. Right. So we, we, although we want to send a message to end sexual abuse, of course, we're looking at, you know, De minimizing and decreasing all child abuse cases in all their types. Now, are, were there any indicators that would give you an understanding of why we had a shift from the physical abuse to sexual abuse? And how, how could you deter persons from these sort of heinous behaviors on our children? Okay, so let me, ask, let me answer your first question first. Mm -hmm. As it relates to the shift, I can only um, assume that um, we're, like I said, we're in our 12th year and us asking the community to report if you hear anything, the community understanding that they can remain anonymous. They don't have to give us their name. We're interested in protecting that child and getting help mm -hmm. for that child. So if you know the area the child lives in, the school the child attends, um, that is what we're, the, the parents name of the child or how we can find that child to give immediate redress, mm -hmm. then that is what is important. And I think because we continue to encourage the public to report, mm -hmm. we are seeing more persons coming forward and reporting. Mm -hmm. um, we also have services that we put in place to assist families once a child report. Because what is very important for us to understand, Tasha, Child abuse don't have any winners, you know. There's so much things that happen negatively um, to families, to children, you know, overall. And so we at Social Development Department try our endeavor best to support our families mm -hmm. and to encourage them, to encourage our boys and girls that are affected by child abuse, to let them know it's not their fault, mm -hmm. what has happened to them, you know, they are not to blame for it and that there are people in the community, there are people in their families that care about them and cares what happens to them and try to encourage them um, if they need um, body safety education and, in, and try to put them in line with those resources mm -hmm. that can help them that we have here available to us. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Bob, from a police perspective, um, what type of statistics do you collect as it relates to child abuse cases and what information or knowledge have you garnered through, throughout the years based on the statistics that you're seeing? First and foremost, I must say um, we do collect um, statistics from, from our database, mm -hmm. which is our police database, which we call it, which is system, where when reports comes in, we, we enter them into a system, the name of the child, you know, the age, you know, the relationship between the child, parents, and so forth. And then we would then have them stored there as only the persons who are working in the family and juvenile unit can see these reports. Mm -hmm. They are on a hidden site, and only us and our senior management team will be able to see these reports. Now, I would agree with Stacy about the increase of sexual offenses mm -hmm. and the way we would categorize them. We categorize them based on the type of offenses. Um, we have now seen an increase. In, in, in more cases of rape, um, incest, mm -hmm. uh, child pornography, unlawful sexual intercourse, and all these various type of offenses. We are now seeing an increase in them. And I agree again with her by saying, because of the education campaign, awareness that we are putting out there to let people know they have the right to report these cases. And we are seeing them coming forward 
and report these cases. Mm -hmm. And as a result of court prosecution, more persons have been arrested and charged, and there are more justice now for children when it comes to cases of child abuse. Mm -hmm. That's why we are seeing a greater increase in the reporting cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the perpetrators, once caught, they're being punished, but child abuse affects the children on a level that surpasses their childhood. How do you deal with that, the effects on the child? And before we even talk about the effects, talk about how can I, as a lay person, identify when signs of child abuse? So we can empower the viewers of this program as well as persons who care and who want to become a part of as to what they should be looking out for as it pertains to like, child abuse. Uh, for example, I will encourage parents, mm -hmm. teachers, persons who come into contact with a child on a daily basis. They may look for signs where a child seems to be no more joyful. They have this sense of not communicating like they used to communicate before. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they're sometimes not fellowshipping with families anymore. They lock themselves away in, in, in bedrooms, not sharing any information again with parents, mm -hmm. you know, shying away from persons who they used to associate themselves with. For example, a, a father maybe used to be the person who takes a child out on a regular basis. All of a sudden, that child doesn't want to have anything to do with that father anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, shying away from school, not showing up in school, maybe seen on the road, mm -hmm. walking when it's time to be in school. A teacher may see a child in the grades, maybe, you know, dropping mm -hmm. And these are some of the signs that, you know, and behavioral patterns that we should look for as a community when a child is being abused. Mm -hmm. Outside, to piggyback off of what um, the detective is saying, outside of um, behavioral signs, there's also some physical signs that persons can look for mm -hmm. as it relates to physical abuse, unexplained welts, unexplained bruises, um, frequent excuses of injuries, um, for instance, you know, I'm falling, I fell on a playground and, you know, the week was raining. Mm -hmm. And so there's no possible way that child could have fallen. Um, as it relates to sexual abuse, um, um, I think that detective covered some as it relates to behavior. However, frequent promiscuity, mm -hmm. uh, like he said, the child specifically doesn't want to be around an, an individual uh, cries a lot, bedwetting is one of the signs that we also look at. Um, and uh, neglect as well is one of the types of cases that we see within our social development department. And persons, especially schools, teachers, if a child shows up um, not groomed very often, mm -hmm. um, not sufficient lunch, um, always complains of tummy aches because they didn't have any breakfast to eat or um, is attends school very early in the morning mm -hmm. and stays very late in the afternoon or late at night, late in the evening, then, you know, all of those are tell, tell signs. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for If I can go back real briefly, I talked about the statistics for 2014 and 2013, but I wanted to just go back and share since or since the year has begun, we continue to see sexual abuse as our highest type. Already we're in April and we've already had seven cases reported to us oh, wow. since the year has begun of a sexual nature. Mm -hmm. um, six cases were of a physical nature and we've had one reported case of neglect. So again, we continue to see, we want to encourage the public to continue to report these incidences to us. It's not about you being a malicious, you know, we investigate all matters. The police does an excellent job at that. Mm -hmm. And so if there's an issue where a, a report is false, you know, we go through and at times, you know, that family just needs support mm -hmm. and need to know that somebody else is there for them. A mom, a dad can be drowning in, um, the efforts with parenting. You know, parenting is difficult for all of us. Right. And nobody don't have a blueprint on parenting. And sometimes they just need to be tapped into the resource that can help them. And that's why we are here. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I want to hear perspective on children to children. Have you ever seen a situation or that maybe perhaps one of your um, children at the YEP institution um, would have become a victim of child abuse and how it has impacted or did it impact other children? I, I, I want to see if there's a link between children to children. Well, compassion in the BVI, although some say is dying, Mm -hmm. It still exists. Mm -hmm. And when you see compassion from a child, it's the purest form of compassion you can see. Um, last year, towards Christmas time, there was a family who was down on their luck. And we put out a call to the members of YEP, the children at YEP and their families, and we put together some boxes of different items for the family. Mm -hmm. And from within the community, Family Support Network and Social Development, mm -hmm. we were able to assist. And that is one thing. But now when you see children sharing lunch with their classmates mm -hmm. because they know they don't have lunch, that's compassion. And I think within the BVI, when it comes to different forms of child abuse, mm -hmm. I think compassion exists. There, there is cruelty, but it, it does happen. And I think that support is needed for children and families who are going through tough times like this. Mm -hmm. Now, as um, Ms. James continues to say that sexual abuse continues to be the leading form of abuse, if you could speak to the community right now to kind of dissuade them from being perpetrators of these acts on our children, what would you say to them? To be quite honest with you, my feelings towards perpetrators of child abuse is very extreme. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that you would need to look into a child's eyes and identify that that is a child that looks to you for protection, mm -hmm. for care, and you violate a child when you break that trust. Mm -hmm. um, once you've identified that there's a difference between a child and an adult, then you should know what you're doing and the impact it will have on a child. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I don't see how an individual could live with themselves knowing they are, that they did or they committed. Mm -hmm. And from the police perspective, I know you've heard from perpetrators. What are some of their reasons as to why they take it upon themselves to abuse these children? Well, in most cases, um, perpetrators never admit, never admit to having sex with um, a minor. But there are rare cases where they will say that it's because of the child, how the way the child portrays, especially a young girl, mm -hmm. the way how they may portray themselves. You know, there are times when they believe that that child was over the age and is ready, mm -hmm. ready to have sex. So, you know, the child may display their age, you know, which is above the age on Facebook mm -hmm. and maybe a text message or something to them and that's why they get involved and you know have sex. Mm -hmm. Now this is a very real concern in the community Ms. James. How would you speak to young ladies to help them not to fall in a situation where these older men may think that they're older women and essentially kind of prey on them. How would they safeguard themselves and not put themselves in a situation to be abused? We're talking about young ladies between a specific age, mm -hmm. or we're talking about younger girls? Because my answer would be a bit different. Um, as it relates to younger girls, mm -hmm. I would say to them, I would say more so to their parents, to educate yourself about, um, educate your children about proper names of body parts mm -hmm. and educate your children about how and when to say no about boundaries and who they should tell and that they should, should always tell if they feel somebody has touched them in a way mm -hmm. that is inappropriate um, and makes them feel uncomfortable inside. Mm -hmm. For older girls, I would say to them along with their parents to have a conversation about your about your young ladies about to your young ladies mm -hmm. about them developing and um, teach them how to dress appropriately mm -hmm. so that they are not seen as being promiscuous or being um, per perceived to be a term we use hair loose mm -hmm. outside of that um, I would say to our young girls to, that sex is a great responsibility. And it comes with knowing 
the consequences that goes along with engaging in sexual activity mm -hmm. and that it is okay to abstain and when you start venturing there although they need to understand too that the legislation is clear about what is a child mm -hmm. and what is an adult and all legislation here in the territory says once you are below the age of consent, even though you've consented, you don't have the right by law to give consent to sex. Mm -hmm. So protect your body, keep yourself safe. If you say no, it means no. Mm -hmm. If you say no, it means no. And to tell somebody you're, you're, you're not going to be seen as a tattletale tell, or whatever, tell somebody if somebody speaks to you in an inappropriate way, tries to touch you in an in inappropriate way, way because this is your body and nobody has the right to touch you, mm -hmm. to speak to you in a derogatory way. Um, and there are persons out there that can help. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you brought that up because it was interesting. When I asked the question to uh, Mr. Th uh, Mr. Bob, I was in my mind, the picture in my mind was younger. But he answered the question older. And then when I asked you, I was asking older because I was piggybacking on his response. Mm -hmm. And you, you broke it down further younger. So in terms of your statistics and how you capture the information, how, is, it, is it broken down into cases that it is um, older or what you call statutory rape as or younger and you call that aggravated rape or it, it, are your statistics broken down now yes that is correct so give us an idea of those statistics so we could get an appreciation for what type of rape we're referring to when we're talking about these sexual abuse cases any girl between the age of 16 and 14 mm -hmm. we have cases where they are statutory rape mm -hmm. by law which we call unlawful sexual intercourse with a girl under the age of 16. Mm -hmm. we have many 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 cases of those in our territory. Mm -hmm. And we also have having unlawful sex with a girl under the age of 13, which is a more serious offense. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing also an increase there where younger girls mm -hmm. are being sexually abused under 13 years of age. Mm -hmm. And the penalty for that is 14 years imprisonment mm -hmm. if you're being convicted in court. So again, we, we also see where there's an increase in incest, reports of incest, mm -hmm. where victims and parents are now more bold to come forward and report their partners, a father, stepfather, or someone who is blood-related. Mm -hmm. We are seeing an increase where people are now becoming braver in, in reporting these cases. So that's why we are now you know, at a stage where we, we are so frightened as to what is happening Mm -hmm. I mean, we know sometimes it does, mm -hmm. but to see and hear these stories from these children as victims, mm -hmm. especially under 13, being sexually molested by you know, a family member, mm -hmm. it, it's really devastating. Ms. Letsom as well, and I'm sure Mr. Mather can bear me out on this. What we see at social development, not just girls are affected, mm -hmm. boys are affected as well. And although, the based on all statistics that we see and we capture, girls continue to be the highest gender that is affected throughout all the types. I want the public to understand and know that our boys are also affected. Mm -hmm. And continue, we continue to see, um, Mr. Mr. Mitha can speak more on that, we continue to see our boys being perpetrated on as well sexually mm -hmm. by both male and female. And so that is important for us to, to make sure that, you know, the public is aware. Now, um, and Bob, of course, can, can share this with me, that our legislation is a bit archaic and we're working on bringing it up to the times. Mm -hmm. Because as it relates to our legislation, our legislation only speaks, is gender specific to girls, mm -hmm. but want, want you know, and, and because we're in the field that we are, we know that boys are being affected. And so we're working with the powers to be, that be to make sure that the legislation is not gender specific, just the girls, but, you know, persons who continue to perpetrate against our children mm -hmm. can be prosecuted. 
to the higher sex center the law mm -hmm. the law well as you 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 dived into the legislation speak about the legislation that assists you with deterring child abuse and how you have worked to strengthen it over the last years uh well bob criminal code okay. mm -hmm. 1999 is it 97 97 uh, speaks to the, the offenses in there that somebody can, if, if they're investigated by, you know, the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force, they can be charged with. As it relates to, I guess he would have to speak to the legislation, as it relates to protection side, remember now, he's dealing with the investigative side mm -hmm. and we continue to deal criminal. with the, the criminal side and investigating and we deal with the protection side. So for us, the Children and Young Persons Act 2005 mandates what we do mm -hmm. once we have identified a child that is in need of care and protection that legislation mandates us to do certain things to make sure that that child gets the care and protection that they need mm -hmm. I know that as a part of your campaign this year you're calling for a community approach to breaking the silence now speak about the community's role as mandatory reporters and how how to get them moving so they could contribute more to helping to break the silence. The same Children and Young Persons Act, mm -hmm. Section 4, speaks to all persons who work with children in churches, in organizations, in schools, wherever children are. Persons who work with children, if they suspect the legislation doesn't say you have to prove. Mm -hmm. If you suspect a child is being hurt, you are mandated by law to make a report to the relevant authorities, the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force, and they make contact with us. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's very important that Mr. Bob and our office continue to work hand in hand mm -hmm. so that when we get those calls, we respond mm -hmm. effectively. If somebody has knowledge that a child may be in harm's way and do not report on summary conviction they can be fined up to six thousand dollars or face a term of three years in prison mm -hmm. if um it is proved that they knew and did nothing about it mm -hmm. now mr Mitha, earlier you alluded to the fact that you attended one of these trainings that social development had as it pertained to the child protection protocol Tell me, how was your involvement, how did it benefit you and the work you're doing and, and to strengthen your capacity to deal with child abuse issues? Well, I can um, say that in the last four years, the ministry and the Department of Social Development and the police force have been at the forefront in our community with um, making the community aware, community awareness, and also when it comes to investigating, prosecuting. I think when we read our newspapers and stuff, we can see that there is a conscious effort towards that. Um, when, we, when I attended the workshops, and the ministry has quite a number of them slated, um, it was eye-opening. The facilitator was a clergyman from Barbados, and he gave a perspective as a person involved in youth work. And his delivery was uh, he delivered a lot of items that gave food for thought. Mm -hmm. Although they did not directly relate to YEP, um, he still presented the importance of having child protection protocols. And immediately preceding that seminar, that workshop, we went into action to make sure that what we had was updated and was in line with what is necessary. Because um, I think over the years, we have noticed as an organization, as a nonprofit, we do research of our members at YEP. And we've seen an increase in when we questioned our members as to who would you report an issue of child abuse to. And we give them options of parents, teachers, YEP staff, police officers, friends. And what we've seen over the last eight years is that the number of responses towards informing those individuals are increasing. Mm -hmm. And that's a positive thing because the more we break the silence about what is happening, the greater awareness we have and hopefully these cases that seem to be flooding us mm -hmm. in a few years hopefully they will decrease because persons who are thinking or who are perpetrating these things may be more reluctant to mm -hmm. do these things. Mm -hmm.
Definitely. Now, earlier you said you don't have to prove anything. You just report. So how do you reduce the occurrence of false reporting? Have you seen any issues with that? Do you find people being malicious and reporting false cases of child abuse? We have our fair share mm -hmm. um, throughout our years. Um, the detective can also speak on that. Uh, but with every case that every report we receive, we have a duty by law mm -hmm. to investigate those cases. So if it's a false report, then that's what it is. And there might be, re there might be things that that family might need um, or services that that family might need mm -hmm. that we will tap into. But we are mandated mm -hmm. to respond and to act on every case, and that is what we do. Before we get ready to wrap up the program, I want to take an opportunity to speak about the assistance provided to victims. How do you assist victims of, of child abuse? Once a report is given to us, we put certain services, like I said, in place. Those services will always include therapeutic services for the child that's been affected, mm -hmm. um, whether through community mental health or whether through privately, if the, the parents also have an option, mm -hmm. if they want to seek therapeutic services privately, they can. Um, as it relates to other services we have, um, we have a public assistance scheme within social development department. So if it requires them getting other services such as um, groceries monthly. Um, we also have services such as um, parenting enrichment seminars. Mm -hmm. At times, like I, I mentioned earlier about parenting be being challenging, maybe they just need some tips and tools in how mm -hmm. to um, act when they get upset or when they get, you know, we offer parenting enrichment seminars to parents. And at times it's court ordered based on if the court sees a need for it. Mm -hmm. But we also encourage parents to get involved with that as well. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the services that we would offer families, as well as um, if there's any other thing within the community, we lend on um, community organizations that we've built our relationships with. Um, YEC has an excellent program during the summer they also, I think they do something with um, science during the summer and those outer islands. Mm -hmm. So if we think that, you know, a mom or dad might need um, that sort of service, we would call up Mr. Mather, call up another organization that we think that they can benefit, Gold Guides, Brownies or whatever it is, and do the connection for that family. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mather, how do you see your role as it pertains to breaking the silence of child abuse? Well, um, because we're a youth organization, we um, provide services for children primarily and not their families. Um, we consider ourselves to be a voice. And like I said before, um, as a safe or ultimate goal is to, for children to see us as a safe haven. Mm -hmm. And once we have achieved that and we achieve the trust of a child, mm -hmm. then we are, we are pleased with what, we, what results we have as long as it's within keeping, keeping within that realm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bob, how, how does the police um, play their role as it pertains to breaking the silence? Well, as we, <clears throat> sorry, as we continue, you know, to enforce the legislation that's available to us, you know, to bring justice to all children of our territory by prosecuting persons, mm -hmm. you know, who have been offending children by committing crime of child abuse against these children. And we also work along quite closely with family sorry, with social development, mm -hmm. in removing children from homes where they have been abused, mm -hmm. or sometimes remove the, the perpetrator who is in that home, you know, if the child doesn't have anywhere else to go. And in most cases now, we are seeing where, you know, the perpetrator's partner is partnering with the perpetrator. So most times now we have to remove the child to a different location mm -hmm. because, you know, what can happen there. So we, 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 we're using everything that's available to us as a means of legislations. And I'm quite 
often as Chris Stacy said earlier, with our legislation, we are we, we are now in the process of getting a, a sex sex offenders list mm -hmm. together so that we can see who are these perpetrators, we offenders, you know, who have been molesting our children so that we can keep them away as fast as possible from them. Mm -hmm. And finally, Ms. James, you, you mentioned earlier that from 2009, you, you signed on to this Break the Silence campaign. Um, in your observation, do you see the community is having more buy-in to the issue? Are you seeing any changes positively as it relates to breaking the silence and ending and child abuse in the community? Definitely, yes. Mm -hmm. I see persons taking ownership and doing what they can to break the silence, to become mm -hmm. aware, to know what the signs and symptoms are. And, you know, I think that our community have to be applauded for, you know, the steps and the strides we've come. And, you know, we have more to go, but I don't want to in any way discount the fact that we've done an excellent job Mm -hmm. uh, throughout the years in reducing incidences, in supporting our families. Um, one, of the mo one of the very important things that we do every year and just don't do it because of is our drive blue, wear blue. Mm -hmm. And to see the public on a whole, mm -hmm. government, private, other agencies, schools buy in and the last Friday of every month, we are doing it again this year on the 24th of April. And to just go around and see the over overwhelming mm -hmm. support that Drive Blue Wear Blue has. And, you know, the message that we, we say to persons is, this is not about us. This is about all survivors that lives among us. Mm -hmm. This is about the brave boys and girls who were brave enough to speak out about what was happening to them. Mm -hmm. And when you wear blue on that day, you're wearing it for them. And we can't share who they are with you, but they see you. They wear it with you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's really, it's really warm hearting to see the public buying in. So yes, I would encourage, you know, everyone mm -hmm. to, if you know of a family in need, if you know persons that are affected, to please call us. Mm -hmm. We're here to help. We're here to support families, and, you know, I, I really hope and, and pray that one day we would become a culture in the Virgin Islands that wouldn't have to worry about this social ill. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the program today, sharing this information with us, and thank you for all the hard work that you do in protecting the territory's most precious resources for children. Thank you, thank you for having us. Child maltreatment happens in every sector of our community. We cannot ignore it. We must address it. By joining forces with the Social Development Department in their efforts to break the silence, we as a territory will demonstrate that we stand firmly against child maltreatment in our Virgin Islands. Let us all do our part to break the silence and to put an end to child abuse because our future generations are depending on us. I want to thank our guests again for coming on the program to share this very important information with us. We all have a part to play in protecting our most precious resources, our children. Reporting for the Ministry of Health and Social Development, I am Public Health Communication Specialist, Natasha Lesson. Peace and blessings.